I'm really excited to um, to welcome everyone today um, through to this webinar series. And uh, it's in collaboration with NASA and TNAFA, TNAFA, so that's Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance and the Traditional Native American Farmers Association. Uh, we did our first webinar last month and it went really great. Um, what we're trying to do is to pull in um, people that are working in wellness and health um, throughout the indigenous communities. Uh, and I think part of my goal in organizing this with Clayton, Clayton Brascape, the founder of TNAFA was to, to bring in voices that we might not have um, heard from and about um, health and wellness that is surrounding all our ideas about food sovereignty. Uh, so I'm really excited to have um, Joe Pitawanakwa with us today. He's uh, founder of Creators Garden and he's been teaching um, and creating educational resources on plant medicines for years and I was introduced to his work uh, during the pandemic when he started doing a lot of recordings and was really impressed with his content and his teaching style and the excitement that was um, surrounding the things that he was talking about um, with wellness and health and plant medicines and how he approaches plant medicines um, in his way from in, in his individual way and also um, from his uh, cultural lens. And I uh, also just wanna let you know that at the end of the webinar, we are gonna be um, doing a random drawing for a gift basket. And Clayton Brascope has um, generously um, wanted to uh, send a gift basket out to someone. So everyone that's um, still on towards the end, we will be doing a drawing from them. And we'll also have a survey if you'd like to fill that out as well. And I um, just want to open up with uh, a few good words to to um, start this as well, and just um, just really thankful um, for for all of our relatives from all corners that are coming together um, to revitalize or to continue practicing all of the beautiful things we have around our food and our culture and. I'm really grateful to my ancestors and to my relatives for the strength and the resilience and the beauty that they walked with to, to get me to this point, to be able to react, uh, interact with, with everyone here. Um, and I'm just really thankful for the people that are our knowledge keepers and really thankful that we're all learners and that we're all teachers. And that's another thing I like about Joe's approach is um, that he has this in a very awesome like conversational format as well so feel free to put your um your questions and your comments in the chat and joe's going to be um, watching those as we go i will be uh, moderating so i'll be looking for any questions that might get missed um, and we can pull those in at the last half hour for the q a and without further ado go for it joe <laughs> all righty here we go here we go <sighs> okay I was just getting all excited. I was like, oh, it's been a while since uh, um, I did gr a group like this. It'd be fun. Okay, uh, cool. Well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. It was funny making this, uh, uh, trying to sort this out with everybody, uh, trying to figure it out last night. It's like everybody was in a different time zone. So I was like, oh, no. <laughs> everything was like a different time i'm real bad with math too so like i was trying to figure it out you know daylight savings or not and i had like i had like four tabs open trying to figure out what time we were getting started <laughs> okay yeah so um i'm joe um from weekwam kong on manitoulin island um i live in peterborough right now pretty close to Toronto I guess like a good an hour and a half close like not that close but close enough um, and I have a whole bunch of really cool stuff to share with everybody I got about an hour uh, that I wanted to present to you guys and then I wanted to open up the last half hour for a discussion uh, to be able to chat um, and yeah like uh, Nicole said in the chat if you use the chat during the presentation, I'm usually pretty good at just kind of watching it. And if I can answer the question on the fly, I'll just sort of embed your question 
uh, in answer to your question into the presentation. Uh, so that usually works pretty well. Plus, I like just watching everybody's banter. <laughs> uh, so feel free to just spam the chat with anything that you're thinking. Uh, it, it actually really helps me. Um, but yeah, um, I, uh, it's real funny. I guess I could start. <laughs> I always like starting by, by saying uh, I, um, I, I was real bad. <laughs> in all of uh, high school, barely passing everything, had to do a fifth year. I think I did grade 12 English four times uh, and, and, I, and I had to beg to pass because um, it, 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 was, it was pretty bad. Um, and so I, um, I, I didn't have much of an academic career and I didn't know what I was going to go to school for. Uh, and I actually went to started a post-secondary program for classical guitar. And uh, that's why these nails are real nice, and then these ones are not. <laughs> and uh, um, I, the only reason why I got into that school was because I was pretty good at classical guitar, I guess. Uh, g given my the the way my transcripts looked, I don't know how they got me into that program, but they did. And uh, and and then I left as soon as I could because <laughs> I was failing everything. And um, the most interesting thing happened was I started to, uh, I was taking my wife to go and visit with my grandma and uh, um, my favorite stories to hear from my grandma was about how she didn't have a hospital. She didn't have uh, a doctor that she had to use. She had to go and pick plants and she had to use plants. <laughs> that, that was her, uh, uh, my most fascinating thing about her. So when I would take my wife, or my girlfriend at the time, wife now, to go and see my grandma, I'd be like, hey, why don't you tell this story? Tell that story. Um, uh, um, well, I, I guess I could just say you're all fast. But it was kind of, it's kind of wild. So like one of my favorite stories and first stories I got her to tell my wife was when one of my uncles uh, stepped on a rusty nail. He, he was, uh, he, he was uh, just a kid she had like nine kids and so when when one stepped on the nail they don't have their vaccines the understanding was that there's a bug inside of that rust that gets in your body and will kill you so um you you're you got to be careful and they ended up playing at a barn they weren't supposed to they, he stepped on a nail it almost went all the way through his foot and then um and his my grandma, his mom, just grabbed a piece of, uh, you know, the resin coming out of spruce trees, uh, the spruce um, gum, bigu, we call it. So she put the, uh, that bigu on his foot and they, and they said, well, we'll have to go to the hospital tomorrow because like the headlights didn't work on the car or something. <laughs> so that to wait until the next day. And they went, so that when they went into the hospital the next day, that doctor, everybody on Manitoulin knows him, his name is Dr. Bailey. It was like his first week being at the hospital in um, Little Perth, and then they, they were taking off his bandage. The doctor was taking off his bandage and he was looking at, you know, it wasn't even clean. His foot was all muddy and uh, with like crusty, bloody mud everywhere. And the doctor was like, what the heck is this? And he took it off and he was looking at that real horrible looking spruce gum, but it smelled good though. He knew that was, he, my grandma was like, yeah, he could smell it, but it, it looks horrible. So he took it off and then he looked inside of the, my uncle's foot and then and he was like super surprised looking at everybody. And then he just put it back <laughs> and he wrapped it up and he was like, so he stepped on a rusty nail yesterday. Uh, and he has no fever yet. And he's like, that's the cleanest cut I've ever seen. He's like, it's just a pink hole. I don't know what that stuff is, but you should just go home. <laughs> so my grandma, you know, her first couple of stories going to the hospital were um, she just got kicked out because the physician told her, whatever you're doing is working better. Because that guy said, Dr. Bailey said, if, if, you came in here with the same with with this story and you came here yesterday he said i would have just taken his foot off i would have had to amputate it there, there because there's no way with no vaccine the onset of infection he's like i would have had to just take his foot so you should just go home keep doing that <laughs> and then uh and so it's kind of wild for me and i was just a kid and i was like man she had to use plants 
<laughs> and uh and then you know even too like her role with her mom in my community was a midwife um her mom you know we had the residential school era that was affecting them right so her mom was a midwife and she had two sons you know or her, she had her sons that were helping her um with that job and planting their food and hunting and fishing and like you know all the food acquisitions there's life stuff so you need help so a lot of people you know you have to have kids because you needed the help and uh she lost those two sons in the war and she she needed a helper so she had my grandma super late had her um i don't know i think she was in her 50s um when she had her so definitely geriatric pregnancy <laughs> i think now it's uh considered geriatric at like 35 or something <laughs> <laughs> or or maybe even 32 I, I can't remember but anyways um she was much older when she had my grandma and uh, at, at the time I just want everybody to know kind of like where this knowledge is coming from because this, it's actually coming from a really special place um so during the residential school era they were um they were recruiting children um of course to be uh, a part of the residential school system uh, and that assimilation process, but also um, what funded a lot of these processes was experimentation, medical experimentation. Um, so there's lots of really amazing stories about medical experimentation, nutrition studies, um, like a, there's a baby formula most people, at least in Canada, know is called Pablum. Um, that formula was created using um, the study subjects of Indigenous children in the residential school system so um they had the studies had inclusionary criteria to satisfy and so when they were coming to take kids from communities they were taking very specific ages genders uh at, at different times and so they were always taking uh little boys and then when my grandma or what my great grandma had my grandma she had her little daughter and um and the criteria changed they needed little girls so my grandma was like or my, my grandma's mom uh, was pretty upset about that. So she made my grandma look like a little boy, put her in dirty overalls, cut off all her hair and taught her how to try to talk in a deep voice. And they stood at the edge of the road when the wagon was going by full of all the children. Um, uh, they stood at the end of, edge of the road and she said, here, take my son. <laughs> and they kept going by. So my grandma got to stay with her mom uh and and be able to spend that time with her and learn about all of the medicines if she got gotten taken in that like in that one moment uh wouldn't have had any of this uh she would have been through the system um and came out of that system of age to be able to have her own family and started her own family without any of this plant medicine knowledge and have been dependent on something like the hospital but luckily for me and all of us here she didn't get taken <laughs> they went by you know, because her grandma was, did a good job at hiding her, I guess. Um, so it's kind of interesting to understand where all of this knowledge is coming from. But uh, to them, it was just a part of life. It was just a normal, everyday thing. It was something, it was just a basic knowledge that everybody always had to have. Uh, because without it, you're, you, you're going to die. Like if you don't know how to sew your clothes when they rip, then you, know, you only have one set of clothes. So uh, you, you have to know how to sew it so the rip doesn't get bigger. You have to know how to cook your foods when you're hungry, uh, like or you'll die. <laughs> so it's really simple. If you get sick or injured, you have to know what kind of medicines you need to be able to fix yourself, uh, and you have to have it kind of like on hand. And so this was just a normal part of everyday life. Um, uh, like like one of the things that I that I really like to share too, just to illustrate that idea even further, is. Um, I went to this one medicine person uh, actually in my community and he was um, he was real happy to share with me uh, a medicine for because he saw my eczema and he said you know what I have a medicine we could make for eczema and he's like it's foolproof I he had a he had a long like 60 year career of using plant-based medicine in a clinical setting and so he, he, he was really confident in the thousands of people he helped with eczema that this is going to be like a foolproof sort of silver bullet option for any eczema flare up to be able to recover from it as quickly as possible. And um, 
and he said he explained the the what the medicine was a bunch of different bark you make tea with that bark and then pour it in your bathtub and soak in it and you come out of there and do that every you know every couple of days in a month your skin is like brand new so i went back to my grandma and i was like hey mama you know i learned this real cool medicine that uh, that you use for bathing to fix all kinds of scars and acne like hormonal problems psoriasis and eczemas and rosaceas and i was just talking with this guy you know he has all this experience with that and she was like oh what what was it oh it's dope boy ash zisa go pamish zari skobi even the ones from she got the ones like just a couple different trees and then she, she smiled really big and she was like oh that's just, that's just a bath uh that that's yeah we used to make that yeah, and that's how that's how we had a bath because we never had soap she her mom would make lye make her own like soap to clean clothes with but that's what that's what we would have a, a bath in like the, we would put it in a basin and we just have a basin bath but that's how we kept clean when we were kids so for her it was really simple uh it was just a normal part of life and so it's like the perspective of when we are reuniting ourselves with shtaba uh, mshkikiyat and like our medicine knowledge we are um we call it therapy now but it wasn't that long ago that this was just normal life so this is actually the way that i'm raising uh my daughter now is really funny um when um we started taking her to school um her baths are only in this kind of uh medicine and so this is what her bath looks like it looks like she's bathing in a bunch of tea which which is exactly what she's doing and uh i remember she was like four or five coming back home from school and she was like hey daddy you know something super weird um i asked everyone like in my whole class even my teachers both teachers um no one bathes in tea uh they just use water and to her i was i was like hey, hey. and she was like i even asked people like outside of my class and the rest of the school and like no everyone just uses water sometimes bubbles and and she was like isn't that weird <laughs> i was like hey ruth i think you're the weird one for the, for this <laughs> and uh, uh but it, it's just kind of like you know that's the way that i wanted to be with her is i just wanted to be like a normal part of life you know it's just like uh you know we have this uh medicine that we make it's it's like a salve um an ointment that we make we put all kinds of good medicine in there and uh and um it's called mindigan and anytime you get a cut or a rash a burn or scars or whatever you put that on um so her um she i think it was just yesterday she woke up after playing in the playground you know there's bird poo everywhere from all the little juvenile birds everywhere pooping and um we saw a pink eye first thing in the morning and that and her eye was just juicing on father's day so sunday and uh, i was like you know we wanted to go watch that elemental movie in the theater and her eye was just dripping and we're like oh no it's like really really bad pink eye <laughs> so we washed all of her hands and then um i put that salve on on her on the tops and on the bottoms we watched our movie uh and we already noticed before bed that she, it, like it's it, it's already regressed um and then when she woke up this morning or yesterday morning absolutely nothing and so for her it's just like yeah when something even her friend fell and got a little scrape on her knee and she was like oh let's go get the minigun <laughs> her friend was like what what's that Should, shouldn't we like i don't know alcohol like clean it off good <laughs> and my daughter was like oh no just put minigun it's like magic trust me it's like magic <laughs> yeah. um it's really funny so um yeah that's just kind of the way that i wanted it to be uh with her is just like a normal thing you know you, you have growing pains or you know you have these issues uh there's always some somebody, somebody something there to support you through that um so i wanted to be able to share with everybody just sort of some of the things and and methods that i've curated over the years i guess um because um 
just to kind of give us an idea of the way that things work. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I learned about plant medicine uh, and from my grandma. And then I started giving medicine away to people in my community who were asking for it. And I would see what those plants were doing. You know, some of my first situations, you know, I grew up with, my mom is a nurse. And so I had medical vocabulary around me my whole life. And, and, and so um, when people would take medicine from me and their hot flashes would go away, you know, their hot flashes they've been dealing with for a decade are gone after, you know, uh, afternoon cup of tea, <laughs> they're sleeping in the same bed as their spouse for the first time in a decade. Like these are the kind of stories that I would hear from people. And I just gave them a bunch of bark, you know, make some tea and have that. And they were like, oh, I would meet, see them in the grocery store. Oh yeah, I had that tea at four o'clock and, and I, I knew right then and there, it was all over, no more hot flashes. Sure enough, you know, two weeks, no hot flashes. And so they're all good. No hot flashes are really deep. Uh, hormonally driven complex issue like if you ever look into um, endocrinology it's probably something you could study for your whole life and still not have any sense of what like like some of the big pictures <laughs> it's really really complex so I was like how, how is this how is this helping <laughs> and uh, it, with you know some conditions that are they're called idiopathic right there's no um, understanding of the cause or contributor of the disease and there's no cu cure there's no uh, comfort measures a lot of the times um, like even with arthritis um, we make medicines for arthritis and um, like <laughs> the one lady was real funny because her finger this just the one finger and it's the arthritis is in the other hands, but you could really see it in the one finger because it got injured and uh, the one finger points in the different direction. So when she wants to point at something that's straight ahead, she has to point her hand in a different way because her finger is crooked. And then I saw her at the grocery store a couple of weeks later and her finger was straightening out. And she says, you know, I got to learn now. I was like that for 30 years. So I got to learn now. Um, to point straight because I still point like this and my finger is pointing not in the right way. And so people are explaining to me like, yeah, this is um, uh, uh, that medicine, you know, it, it works. And so with my understanding of what idiopathic conditions were, um, the, um, the, the, for medicines to be able to help was pretty striking so I started to teach large groups in my community then other communities started to say hey there's this kid in wiki teaching about this medicine and then let's get him to teach over here and then over here and then then all of a sudden I was getting like three oil changes every month and <laughs> traveling everywhere teaching huge groups and throughout that teaching experience I started to um I started to run into situations where I was, uh, uh, you know, there would be barriers in a lot of the places that I would go to. Uh, one of the barriers, um, probably the most powerful barrier so far has been um, the physician or the pharmacist. Um, because uh, in, in Ontario, anyways, it's going to be a different acronym probably everywhere, but there's uh, policies that enforce guidelines uh, that physicians have to follow. And the guidelines for Ontario are really clear that if you are, uh, that, that physicians should be supporting alternative care methods, strategies. Um, but uh, the, the point just before that says, if the alternative form of care being sought out by the, by the patient is not uh, evidence-based, then it must not be supported. And that's where we kind of have issues. There, there's no um, evidence for plant medicine as being effective in the treatment of acute or chronic disease. Um, and so I was having these experiences showing everybody. So like I formulated workshops for years um, that were to serve as evidence. Um, so I would take... Um, uh, um, medicines and uh, and give them to large groups and the physicians nurses uh, the clinical staff would be there to observe the results um, 
the, the results being, you know, what, what I experience every day, like it works. You could see it right now. Like it, one of my favorites to do over those couple of years was um, using Tamarack Bark. Um, Tamarack is um, Larix Laricea. That's, uh, we call it Shkiglot de Mons. And you, you make this foot soak and um, for people with diabetic neuropathy, so when they have no feeling in their feet or painful feet, um, when you soak your feet into that medicine in a half hour, you feel temperature change in an hour and a half, you're, you have kind of uh, pins and needles with no ne uh, neuropathic pain associated with it. And then in three hours, the nurses can do a prick test and you have sensation throughout your entire foot. So I was kind of like, here, there's your evidence. <laughs> it works quite well and um uh, uh that's obviously not w um qualified evidence is one thing and one thing only that's that's a, a properly designed properly controlled tenured um randomized control clinical trial that's that's what evidence that's what creates evidence and so um we don't have that for plant medicine uh, and so it cannot be supported. So my work then is dedicated uh, to trying to break that barrier. So to first of all, understand that uh, our plant medicine is a very, very valid form of therapy. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, um, and there's all kinds of really amazing ways. Okay, so I, I, I want to show you guys stuff. <laughs> I got to stop uh, ra uh, rambling. Uh, so when you're, um, the way that plant medicine works, it's kind of really interesting. I, I kind of like talking about um, our creation story, uh, our creation stories. Uh, so in our Nishnabek creation story, and, and this is kind of like uh, pretty um a universal idea in our creation story you have this moment where the creator is uh holding the first human in sitting inside of a shell um and then the creator breathes life into that or spirit into the person and that makes us who we are um but a really important thing that happens in that moment is that shell what it is is a representation of everything that was already created and so in that moment what you have is everything that was cr already created was used to form our body, was used to create ourselves. And so I was like, you, you know, even like biblical references, uh, um, the uh, famous Genesis story line where you have uh, uh, let us make man in our image. Um, and a lot of commentators on, on this uh, text will say that the only thing that uh, God could have been talking to in that moment in creation was creation itself. Nothing else was created at that point yet, uh, according to this text. And so um, even in that moment, uh, human beings are a culmination of all of the elements that make up earth are used to form our body. Um, and so the way that medicine works is you have um, you you have all of these different plants that were used to form all all of our um, different body parts, um, and so if this plant was used to form was used to create this part of of our body, um, then this plant contains with it an original instruction, um, and it's that original instruction that is going to um, correct a certain issue that is wrong. So if we have something wrong with our colon or female reproductive tissues um, the, or our bones, all of these plants contain within, within them, if they were used to form these parts of our bodies, they contain within them the original instruction and the use of or the use of plant medicine is a simple consultation with that plant to say, hey, something is wrong with this part of my body and I need that to be corrected. And you were used to form this part of my body. And so because you contain that original instruction, you're going to tell this part of my body how to work properly again. And so all plant medicine is, is a consultation with exogenous plant chemistry that is designed to uh, uh, get to a, a normal. That's all this is. All plant medicine 
is designed to do and all plant medicine can do is get us to normal. Um, and so it's really fun to kind of play around with some of those images and then to see yourself as a reflection of everything that is outside. I know those went by really fast. Luckily for you, this is recorded. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, the, um, uh, when you're um, um, using plant medicines, I think that it's really important to understand ex exactly how they work. Um, uh, so that was a lot of the work that I have done over the years is, is learning all of the chemistry that different plants have. Um, so every plant is going to have anywhere between 80 to 200, 250 different chemical constituents inside of it that are, <laughs> here, I'll play it again. Uh, uh, um, and and I'll, I'll play it slower <laughs> from the beginning. Uh, yeah, so every single plant that we use that we consult with for medicine is going to have, yeah, like 100 uh, to 250 different chemical constituents inside of it. Each one of those chemicals is going to have hundreds of studies done on it to understand that plant chemicals, physiological function, what does this chemical do inside of your body? How does it fix this problem? And what the, what the biochemistry will do is map out, it's called a mechanism of action. And what they take is uh, that plant chemical uh, understand what it does inside of the body and how it does it. Once they have that mechanism of action, what they do then is they will create a synthetic um, chemical analog, uh, a synthetic mimetic that is designed to mimic the mechanism of action of that plant chemical. And that's what goes on to do all of the pharmaceutical, uh, become pharmaceutical drugs. That's what goes on to become uh, to go through the randomized control trial process uh, to be evidence-based uh, uh, to understand cause and effect relationships between plants as an intervention uh, that causes uh, positive or negative human health outcomes. And so um, when you're when you can understand that when we're using plant medicines, we're just consulting with exogenous plant chemistry. Um, and we could understand that over 85% of every pharmaceutical drug that has ever been discovered comes from plants. Uh, and, and then we can sort of understand pretty early on that plant medicines and pharmaceutical drugs are not that different. They're kind of, actually one is trying to do exactly what the plant is doing. The only downfall of pharmaceutical industry is that they are not able to copy exactly what the plants do very often. Um, and there are singling out one chemical inside of the plant, not a synergy of 250 chemicals working together. Uh, and so you, you have this kind of uh, understanding of Western medicine or pharmaceutical drugs as being a diluted form of plant potential. That's the way that I like to see it. Uh, but a great partnership we are. And so my job and main responsibility, I think, is getting primary care uh, into a place and understanding uh, of this great partnership between plant medicines and pharmaceutical drugs. Uh, like, um, uh, oh man, okay. So there are, um, so yeah, I just wanted to explain the way that plant medicine works. Uh, um, uh, more often than not, they are toxins that the plant is creating to try to defend itself. And th those toxins come into your body and um, um, cause, cause harm or elicit the idea of harm. Uh, more often than not, we're not ingesting it, enough plant medicines to uh, cause damage, but we're, we're ingesting enough medicine to elicit a response, to cause our body to, uh, to have this sort of panic. Um, so when you're looking at like uh, the photo of my daughter in the bathtub with in, in all of the tea, the mechanism of that medicine is it's acids. <laughs> it's a bunch of different trees that have very specific types of acid inside of them that destroy your skin. If you stayed in that tub too long, um, you would cause harm. Uh, you stay in there for a half hour, 20 minutes, half hour or something. You don't stay in there for five hours. And actually it wears away at the enamel of your tub. Um, you have to re-enamel your tub every couple of years. Um, so this acid bath, it, it's kind of a really crazy idea that like why I would do this with your daughter. <laughs> um, but when you go into the tub, it causes a certain amount of harm. Um, 
um, uh, if you if you stay in there too long, but the 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 dose is what makes it right. So you go in the tub, and it and and that acid eats away at your skin, and your skin will panic. Your skin will say, "Hey, we're sitting in acid. I need everything that I, I need to be able to protect my skin. I need more blood volume. I need more nutrition coming to our skin, uh, and and most importantly, I I need we need to activate." Uh, all of our defenses, that, that defense mechanism that every skin cell has um, is, is uh, um, mainly one specific pathway. It's called the NRF2 pathway. Um, so NRF2 is basically a program that sits inside of the skin of every cell inside of your body, a uh, little computer program, and it's anchored in that skin by a protein called uh, KEP, KEAP1 or 2, depending on where it is. So that protein keeps that program inside of the skin. And that program has the instructions to cause over 800 endogenous anti-inflammatory and antioxidative processes. So if our body needs to heal a certain part, that computer program needs to get into the nucleus of the cell and begin that instruction and call for that action. Um, and, but it's bound into that cell. It's anchored there by that keep one protein. So when you go into the bathtub and it's start, it's acid eating away at all of your skin, your body will panic and it'll say, oh my God, we have to get out of here. Uh, we need to protect our skin for as long as possible. And so you have an uncleavage of keep one and two proteins from that NRF2 program. That program gets to the nucleus and begins over 800 endogenous anti-inflammatory and antioxidative processes. And uh, then you get out of the tub and you dry off and you're out of that insult and you're left living all day with all of this antioxidant and anti-inflammatory potential. You're living all day with more blood volume and more nutritive, nutritive supports to that part of your body, to that particular tissue. Uh, and so that's the way that this works. This is why we're able to help with eczema flare-ups and scar tissue and rosaceas and psoriasis and um, all of these different things. And this is why my grandma remembers funerals when she was growing up. No one, regardless of how, how old they were, had scars. And so it's really fun to kind of uh, see the mechanism of medicine. You know, when you're looking at cardiovascular system medicine, like these are... Um, uh, cardiovascular uh, toxins. They're coming into the system and they're, and with, with the intention to cause harm, but we're enjoying a couple cups of tea and it's not actually enough exogenous chemistry. It's not enough of a load that there actually will be harm. There's enough to elicit a response though. That NRF2 pathway opens up. You have all this inflammatory, anti-inflammatory and antioxidant potential that's going to clean everything up. Anti, uh, um, you know, glycative processes, um, uh, it, it, you know, protecting us from sugar is, is often uh, a very powerful mechanism that plants will use is we'll protect a particular tissue from taking sugar in um, uh, um, at the burden or probably expense of other tissue. Uh, but with the um, abandonment of uh, glucose toxicity, then tissue is able to heal. Um, so that's a mechanism that plant medicine uses often. Um, but uh, yeah, I just wanted to give us a really good idea into uh, how uh, medicine works. Um, so I wanted to also kind of go back to plant medicines too and say that, you know, when you're looking at all of these different um, uh, here, let me see. If, when you're looking at all of these different medicines, um, it's really, really fascinating to be able to see um, to see that every single one of these plants has a very special gift to be able to share. Um, and and I'm, I spend maybe perhaps now most of my time sharing with people what these gifts are. Um, like you can like what these images are suggesting. We have women's medicine, bone medicine, intestine medicine. You think of all of the issues that are affecting this and that can affect this part of your body. And we have plants that contain instruction to help this tissue operate the way that it should, the way that it's meant to. 
Um, and so for plants to be able to come in and help with osteoporosis uh, um, and synoviolitis or, you know, to have uh, muscle medicines come in and to be able to help mitigate the frailty issues that we have, especially now associated with new drugs like Ozempic, uh, you have medicines that support really important detoxification systems, uh, energy absorption and utilization systems, and uh, the highway our immune system uses. You have amazing medicines that help support your liver, which is important in detoxification and so many regulatory processes. Uh, we have all of these plants offer an amazing gift to be able to support and, and maintain original, in, in, original uh, function of so many different organ systems and, and, and processes that our body has and goes through. Lung medicine, you think of how valuable that was. Mental health medicine and sleep uh, and, and uh, you know, to do with nerves, all of these plants have really, really incredible gifts to be able to share with us. And we are, um, uh, um, I, I like to even say responsible to these gifts. Uh, we're responsible. It's a, it's, it's a basic human responsibility to understand the plant, uh, what gifts plants have to be able to offer. Um, and uh, to be able to use them. I mean, my grandma described uh, for me when I was young, she described torture. Um, there was a really nasty kind of incident that happened in our family. And my grandma de described um, to her what actually torture is. She said, torture is when you have children. And, uh, <clears throat> but she didn't stop there. She said, Tor uh, torture is when you have children and you know, you know what their gifts are, and you have to watch them live a life with no opportunity to express those gifts, no opportunity to be able to live to their fullest potential. That's what torture is. And uh, I, she was experiencing that at the time, I think, with kids and grandkids. And so she said that to us. And so it's like, um, my job then is to I identify anything, you know, with my daughter, she's picking rocks and putting rocks in the car and you know we had rocks everywhere one summer in every pocket of of the vehicle in every pocket of every bag just in the bottom of all of our medicine bags there was rocks everywhere so i was like okay you know my grandma said so we have a we have a pick for rocks and the goggles to put on and UV lights to see the rocks that fluoresce in their different colors. She has stacks of books on minerals and rocks and little samples and all of these, everything, because I want to be able to support her through this potential gift or this potential talent that she has. So I'm totally obsessed with um, uh, give, giving um, ev really everyone around me the opportunity to live to their fullest potential to see gifts that they have and, and get them into a place and position where they could express those gifts and live to their fullest potential. And I think that that's something that we should be doing with plants as well, to be able to do our due diligence, our basic human responsibility in consulting with the, the, the medicinal plant chemistry uh, to get our body working properly. But what we're doing in that process is we're seeing the gifts that the plant has, and we're giving it an opportunity to express that gift, to live to its fullest potential. And I think that it's really amazing to see that human beings, this is a very unique characteristic that we have. Yes, other, other animals will use plants as therapy, will use other medicines as therapy. But you know what's interesting is that every other animal will run that plant into extinction if they have to. So it's made evident by so many different studies, like the caribou study in Lake Superior, dumped a bunch of caribou on an island, they, and, and they, they reproduced and multiplied for years until one year the entire population collapsed every single one of them was dead because they ate all of their food uh into extinction and so this is the confines of uh of other animals instinct and we are outside of the realms of instinct where we can look at a plant and see a gift that it has and give it the opportunity to express those gifts and live to its fullest potential but also we can give it gifts back we can help them. And just like when we get a gift from every, anybody, it's basic human responsibility, right? A basic human relationship stuff. When somebody gives us a really good gift, uh, we want to give something back right away as soon as possible. Uh, and then a lot of the times too, I mean, you know this around Christmas time, you want to not just give them something back, but 
you usually, you know, if you can, you're going to want to do a little bit better. Like, you know, they gave me this thing. You know, it's worth about this much. It was really special, but I'm just going to go a little bit higher this year. Give them something just a little bit better. So I'll be real happy about that. And then they'll get that gift and they'll be thinking the same thing. You know, they gave me a really cool gift last year. And you know what? It was worth this much. And so I'm just going to go a little bit higher and then higher and higher and higher. And then all of a sudden Christmas is just a, a nightmare. Uh, so when you're, it's just basic kind of human responsibility. When you get a gift from somebody, you want to give something back. So when we're going out and we're picking medicine and we're able to experience that gift where we're able to soak our feet in the tamarack bark tea, and then we're able to walk again in three hours. Um, and, and after soaking your feet for a few days, you have no sign of diabetic neuropathy whatsoever uh, or, or chemotherapy, chemical induced neuropathies. Uh, you have no sign of it whatsoever. And so it's like, well, that's a really good gift that this plant was able to give me. And, and our, our desire to uh, satisfy that relationship is to give a gift back to the plant, to be able to sit, look at that plant and say, hey, you know, what do you need? Well, how can I help you? Um, to, to be able to be more successful, just like you helped me to become more successful. I could walk again. So how can I help you? And so to study protocol of harvesting, being one of the most important thing, I have people here from all over the world, literally. And so I, I want all of us to be responsible for that protocol to say, hey, you know what? I, I need to figure out how I could give something back to this plant. And you'll think like, oh, I could give it water when it's dry, or, or I, could, I could mend the soil, or, or I could to introduce a companion species uh, uh, but I think every plant has embedded into it a process that if you accomplish uh, you you will uh, um, sorry has a problem every plant has a problem associated with its ability to reproduce so human beings are able to solve that problem more often than not um, so like uh, I wonder if I even have it here um, is uh whoop yeah right here uh so this plant here pitcher plants makakin das sericea purpurea um really really beautiful carnivorous plant throughout the entire boreal probably have nobody from the boreal forest here but pitcher plants occur all over the world and they have the same chemistry the same mechanism the same function which is to help with back pain uh, uh, so like sciatica and things, the, we use the roots here, we use the roots and it might be different in other parts of the world. Uh, but we use these roots, you put them into your lip, there's saponins that are absorbed, um, uh, sublingually. So the chemical, uh, that has the medicinal effect is absorbed within 15 minutes, which is pretty instant. And, and so, uh, you put a little piece of the root in your lip and people are, uh, your, it draws calcium out of every sensory neuron in your lumbar. And the research so far has suggested that it seems to establish a shunting mechanism to prevent the re-inoculation of calcium uh, for days. And so when your, when your sensory neurons have no calcium in them, they are not sending pain signals to the DRG for your brain to understand that your back hurts. Your pain is gone in 15 minutes and you have people standing up for the first time in a decade after having this. I, and I even did this in a room. We had set, I had a community uh, bring in, uh, look through their roster, identified 70 people with uh, sciatica and they all came for lunch. After they lunch, they put a, this root in their mouth. And um, in 25 minutes, the entire room was bawling their eyes out because they couldn't believe the amount of relief that they were experiencing. Uh, and so it was really incredible gift that this plant has to be able to share with people, to be able to share with uh, uh, large groups like this. And so I wanted us to be able to see uh, the reproductive problem that this plant has. It has a really long stem. And at the top of the stem, it's got a cluster of 800 seeds, a little seed pod that'll have 800 seeds. The problem is this plant is really competitive for space. It really loves to grow where there's no other plants around it. And so uh, it doesn't like competition. So if these seeds from this pod fall within one foot of the parent plant, that parent will hormonally sterilize all of those seeds and they will not grow there. So you th that's why it makes a really long stem is because it's trying to drop those seeds away from, from the parent. But that doesn't happen. On most plants, you could see that it has year after year after year of still erect stems from years past. 
And so you could see this really simple problem, you know, like, well, what can I do to help? There's the seed pod inside there. Uh, so, so yeah, we could just ask, well, what can I do to help this plant then? And we could see its problem. Well, its problem is that it's waiting for like literally a, a, a moose knuckle to hit the seed pod and allow them to spread just a little ways away. So how do you help this plant? Grab the seed pod and take the seeds more than a foot away from the parent. And so we've effectively covered probably to the uh, to to a point of devastation, but a, a bog in three years that had like you know a dozen of these plants, we have now a carpet of pitcher plants, and and communities from all over Manitoulin have been harvesting hundreds of these roots from it without even making a dent, and that's from three years of just throwing seeds around in the fall, just when we're driving by. So we have we we have the ability, the unique ability. It's a it's a human gift to be able to be in a reciprocal relationship with a plant where we're not just utilizing it for the gifts that it has. We're not, but we're giving the plant the the ability to live, to express gifts that it has and live to its fullest potential. And uh, but also we're able to give something really incredible back to be able to say, hey, you know what? You don't have to wait for no moose knuckle. Uh, I'm going to come here every fall and I'm going to spread you around. And you know what? There's a sphagnum bog just down the road. You, you're you actually not even there. So I'll go take you over there. You'll be there next year. Uh, and, and then, you, you know what? In the, in the north, uh, co communities that are surrounded by sphagnum bogs have done this, you know, with school classes. Um, the schools just go out into the, into the um, skid kip and grab those seed pods throw them around everywhere and you could see on the right beside the boardwalk is just a mat of pitcher plants uh so guess who's managing their back pain it doesn't help with just the acute pain management issues either um it protects nerves for, uh, and specifically the nerves in the back uh and throughout the spine from um glucose toxicity so um uh, glucose is toxic to almost every cell inside of your body. Only very few, very specialized cells require sugar, uh, which is why, why your body is able to make out of any substrate almost uh, its own sugar. Um, but you have these, uh, uh, the, this tissue is almost never able to heal in the presence of an insult. Uh, and our insult today is more often than not um, exogenous carbohydrate or, or sugar, eating sugar, eating any carbohydrates to speak of whatsoever is going to cause a, a hyperglycemic state uh, that is going to prevent tissue from being able to heal. That's why I mentioned earlier, a lot of the plant mechanisms, the reason and way that they're able to help certain tissues is protect tissue from sugar. So that's how pitcher plants are going to help with chronic, uh, the chronic cause, not just dealing with the pain, but give that tissue the ability to heal. Um, they did this really cool study where they severed a uh, the, the whole sciatic nerve in, in rats and, and, uh, and they had their controls uh, all set up and the rats that had the pitcher plants um, and sugar uh, were still able to heal. So it prevents the, uh, that tissue from uh, the uptake of glucose, pre pre prevent it, protecting them from sugar. So when they're protected from sugar, they're able to heal. Obviously you don't need plants medicines to do this. We could just eat a species appropriate diet which is completely absent of any form of carbohydrate to speak of. Uh, but yeah, I wanted to be able to share um, what I think are, um, oh yeah, that's what I, oh my God, it's 32. How the heck did that happen? See, it's rambling. Okay, my bad. Okay, so what I really wanted everybody to be able to understand is that, yeah, plants, uh, plant and people relationships is just a basic human responsibility and that we should be doing everything that we can to be able to learn as much as we can about, about these relationships. I do the best that I can for the territory that I'm in, uh, but, but I know every, every territory and every place uh, and every Indigenous group that has occupied that territory for the last 10,000 years is going to have a really good understanding of what these relationships look like. Um, and and pursue, pursuing that knowledge is very valuable for you just to be able to, you know, live normally. Like I said, and we call it therapy now, and we have this really, really kind of odd sense of the way that things work when it comes to healthcare now, but um, all we're trying to do is just be normal, right? We're just trying to feel, get back to baseline, see what normal feels like. Um, and, um, 
this is a, a plant medicines is a very appropriate pathway to get us to that place of normal. Um, but I wanted to be able to share um, uh, th this idea. Um, and I think we have enough background to be able to understand it that I could just say it kind of straight up. And this is where most of my work is going now. Uh, so in working with plant medicines over the years, I've realized that um, uh, um, you know, there's, there's, there's this phenomenon with Indigenous people. It's, it's with people generally, but Indigenous people seem to be dis disproportionately affected by um, morbidity, that is death caused by late detection of disease. Uh, so we actually have stories of people who um, were going to the hospital because they had breathing problems when they had non-infectious pneumonia that was due to kidney failure from diabetes. <laughs> so you think of how late, how, how many of us will get diagnosed with pre-diabetes for like five years before we actually get diabetes and then have diabetes for 30 years before we have nephropathy to the point where we need dialysis uh, to keep the fluid out of our lungs. And here we have people being admitted uh, with non-infectious, non non-pathogenic pneumonia because of kidney failure, because of diabetes. It's kind of wild think about how this happens but one of the issues that we face is late detection of disease and I wanted to use this as a model to be able to share with us the way that plant medicine works right so we have um, uh, the reason why we have this late detection phenomenon most not just indigenous people like I said everybody's going to have it like when we get uh, when we're starting to feel sick we do everything we can to not go to the hospital you Google your symptoms, you diagnose your, you do your best to diagnose yourself, and then you're having uh, oregano oil and you're boiling garlic and onions with cabbage and, and mixing it with a half a cup of apple cider vinegar and drinking that 10 times a day just so that you don't have to go back to the hospital or don't have to go to the hospital. And, uh, and then eventually it's like, oh, okay, I just got to go, I got to go in. <laughs> so you do everything you can to not go to the hospital first, right? So that's the same as well with uh, within our culture, our cultural knowledge is, is a basic or intrinsic responsibility to do everything you can in the face of illness to get better before you have to use medicine. So before you use medicine, you need to do everything you can first. That's a historical, cultural, uh, traditional idea. So uh, that is something that we should be doing, right? And so... Um, uh, that is something that we have always done. And that is something that is kind of built into our knowledge and understanding of things. So of course, of course, we're going to have disproportionate morbidity associated with late detection of disease because we're responsible to try to do everything we can first. So that is changing what we're eating. You know, if we realize, oh, okay, so I haven't really moved off of this couch or out of this house in the last six months, maybe I should start going for a little walks. And, 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 and so, um, you know, I've been eating 800 grams of carbohydrates a day. Maybe, maybe this can change a little. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I haven't been, uh, you know, this, that, and the other thing. So we, the point is, is that I, I think uh, um, we're responsible, like plant medicines are, are not and should not be the first therapy sought out by somebody who is suffering from either acute or chronic disease. Um, and so when we are trying to triage cultural components into a healthcare setting, um, medicine is not gonna be number one, almost never. Uh, like you take somebody with diabetes, you when we look at the 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 medicine that we use for diabetes, um, you know, and people have this medicine. Uh, I actually gave it to a community who, uh, looking at the data in that community, the the um, amount of insulin going into the community um, dropped and uh, so much that we were kind of able to realize that either 700 people in this community died or 700 people in this community stopped using insulin. And in my follow-up with the community, it was because they stopped using insulin. 
And, and it was thanks to using this medicine again, which they were sitting literally in a giant garden full of this plant. Like this was the grass that grew in that remote northern flying community. And so for 700 people out of 3,500 people, you do the math, what, what percentage is that, that of that community uh, as a whole, not just the diabetics in that community, but as a whole got off of insulin. Uh, so that's a really, really incredible story, right? Well, three months later, they were all back on insulin. <laughs> Because this medicine is able to help, but it's not able to do, uh, like, like if you're looking at something like diabetes uh, and insulin dependent diabetes, um, what uh, all diabetes is, is uncontrolled blood glucose. Um, so this medicine is helping. It's actually doing the exact same thing as metformin, maybe arguably a little bit better. Uh, metformin is increasing uh, or stimulating AMPK in the liver. Um, uh, and also stimulating the GLUT4 expression on the surface of skeletal muscle cells, allowing sugar to enter into muscles. Um, and so um, this medicine shares the exact same mechanism. Uh, actually, uh, metformin, the idea of metformin was first modeled after this until they found it in a bacteria and some or some fungus in Madagascar or something. Uh, the idea to create that drug started with Labrador tea. So it makes sense that it's doing the exact same thing. So you think of how effective metformin is, the industry that it was able to create, um, they got the idea from this plant. Uh, so now when we're looking at uh, Labrador tea, we, we need to understand, okay, what is it doing? What does stimulating AMPK in the liver mean? And what it means is that it's making your liver think that uh, um, it, your, your body has a, a, enough energy. And so your liver will stop producing uh, sugar. And your liver will stop manufacturing sugar and stop spewing out sugar into your bloodstream. Um, stimulating AMPK is a really, really um, special process. Uh, you know, if anybody is diabetic or, or has fear of being uh, developing diabetes, uh, um, understanding that pathway AMPK in the liver is very, very important. Um, it's really interesting because you could stimulate AMPK in the liver, uh, literally uh, orders of magnitude more powerful than Labrador tea and metformin combined um, by restricting carbohydrates. Uh, most people, if we get our carbohydrate intake below 100 grams a day, um, which is still uh, you know, pretty manageable for most people, considered low carb by most standards around the world, um, we are stimulating AMPK like 10 times more than Labrador tea and metformin could ever even dream of doing. So if you're able to do what this medicine does without even taking the medicine by changing what you're eating, then that sounds, and, and it's 10 times more effective. This is my favorite thing is that I think that plant medicines are a far greater teacher than they are a therapy that we could listen to the mechanisms of these medicines, how they are working, how does pitcher plants work? How do all of those plants that were flying by us earlier, what is their mechanism? How exactly do they work? Uh, and a lot of their mechanisms have to do with sugar, protecting us from sugar. Uh, what is the human requirement for carbohydrates for a single day? How many carbohydrates do we need every single day to stay alive? Um, I, I wonder uh, what most people are thinking. Um, if you're looking at carbohydrates and their requirements, generally, most people, most dietetics organizations around the world will say you need 150 grams of carbohydrates a day uh, to stay alive when uh, that's a, a little bit misleading because the only cells that require sugar inside of your body, if you look at the amount of sugar that they need, uh, they will use between 150 to 180 grams of carbohydrates a day, but the human requirement for carbohydrates is zero. We are designed absolutely to live our entire lives without having one gram of one carbohydrate ever, and everything is going to be more than okay because your body is able to make it on its own more effectively and more efficiently than if you were to eat it to be able to convert lactate into glucose, um, gluconeogenic amino acids and the glycerol backbone of triglycerides are all more efficient pathways to accessing and raising blood sugar than it is to actually eat the sugar itself. 
So if your body is just making its sugar on its own via gluconeogenesis, the, you, and, you, and we could realize that you do not need one gram of one carbohydrate ever over the course of an entire lifetime, and the mechanism of so much of our medicines, especially the Labrador tea, is uh, um, uh, trying to do what carbohydrate restriction is, is doing, then it makes a lot more sense to uh, change what we're eating. So if you're triaging healthcare, we're trying to figure out like, okay, where does medicine fit? Because it's not number one, what is number one? Uh, and more often than not over the past, maybe six years, um, um, culturally appropriate or biologically appropriate um, species appropriate nutrition has been making its way to occupying that number one spot for so many different conditions. I mean, even in this presentation so far, we talk about sciatica, uh, skin problems, um, so, so many, all of the different things, osteoporosis and lung problems and liver function, lymphatic system. We talked about all these different things um, and what seems to be more effective at treating these chronic conditions is eating appropriately. We're mimicking the mechanism of that medicine uh, um, times 10 times 50 by changing what we're eating so if we're listening to medicines as being greater teachers than they are therapies uh then we're getting at an uh um the the real treatment so think about it this way these plants are trying to tell us what to do i mean you look at the other the other mechanism that i mentioned of metformin and labrador tea is uh glute four expression on the surface of skeletal muscle tissues so your muscles are supposed to grab the sugar and burn it and use it as energy. That's the way we're supposed to control our blood sugar. Um, but the problem is our muscles are full already. So that sugar doesn't, is not allowed into the muscles and it goes into your kidneys, nerves, eyes, blood vessels. That's why with uncontrolled blood glucose, in the case of diabetes, you have kidney function declines till you're on dialysis. You have peripheral neuropathy till you have no feeling. Uh, you cannot heal from bruises. You have glaucoma, macular, early onset macular degeneration, all of these because these are glucose disposal sites because that sugar is not allowed into the muscle. So it's going to go elsewhere uh, and damage those parts. So we have all those damages associated with diabetes because the sugar is not allowed into the muscle. Well, exogenous chemistry from Labrador tea and metformin will force the muscles open so they accept sugar. So you're going to see your blood sugar is much easier to control. But it's not solving the problem. If you're looking at how to stimulate GLUT4 expression on the surface of skeletal muscle tissue, the answer is exercise. You're doing over 100 times more powerful GLUT4 activation um, than metformin and Labrador tea combined with less than 20 minutes of not even moderate activity a day. That's like moderate activity is defined as an activity that you should be able to have a full unabated conversation with somebody if you have to stop and catch your breath it's too intense so less than 20 minutes of that a day um, where you're able to maintain a full unabated conversation that's not much exercise that tends to be pretty doable for a lot of people uh, so if you're listening to this medicine as a greater teacher than it is a therapy we're looking at carbohydrate restriction hopefully to a biologically appropriate zero uh, and exercise less than 20 minutes where you're able to have full conversations still without having to catch your breath. And so that's what these medicines are trying to tell us to, to do. And so if we're listening to these medicines as great teachers, then we're able to understand where the real therapy is and why medicine is so far on that triaged approach to culturally appropriate triaged approach to healthcare. It's so far down because it's telling us to do all of these other things first. Uh, to be engaged in, uh, chronically engaged in all of these different cultural components, uh, proper nutrition, exercise, um, sweat lodges or sauna as a form of therapy, um, embracing the cold or, or cold shock therapy, fasting. You have all of these incredible parts of our culture that, that, that are designed to help us get to a, our baseline. And once we get to that baseline level of health, um, then we're able to see where the problems are. Now we could figure out what medicines do we need. That's when you use medicine as a therapy. Uh, so the last thing that I wanted to share with everybody is um, uh, really quick. I know I'm just blasting through a whole bunch of stuff. I was going to make it nice and simple for you guys, but I just wanted to be able to share with you guys this one. 
because I, 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 uh, I do focus all, almost all of my energy on nutrition now. Uh, whenever we're looking at acute and chronic diseases, nutrition is absolutely the most important thing to consider. So it, it has occupied most of the teaching that I, I've been doing for the past half a decade. Um, and But I wanted to share with you guys a one, one way, possibly the only way, that I think plant medicine in that culturally appropriate triaged approach to healthcare, that medicine should be number one, and that's in addictions. Um, I think when it comes to addictions, uh, nothing is even is ever going to come close to plant medicines in their in their ability to help. Uh, so this is Wood Betney Nadwanak or Pedicularis canadensis. You saw the name flash by earlier. It has a massive distribution, so I'm not too shy to share this for everybody here today. Um, it's a parasitic plant as well, so it parasitizes you know 80 species of grass alone. So it can uh, it can pretty well go anywhere and everywhere. Uh, I've had multiple people over the pandemic uh, share with me last year and this year that they have it now in their lawn. Um, they got seeds through their lawn and there it is. It was that simple. Um, so I wanted to share this one with you guys. This is what we use for um, opiate addiction. This is very, very simple. Um, you know, um, we... Um, I I have stories about this plant. I could be here for weeks. This is my favorite field to work in. And when it comes to plant medicines, it's where, where how I work the most. And so this is um, super special to me. Um, this is what we use for opiate addictions, and it's as simple as uh, you know we make tea with the roots, and uh, of this you know pretty you know common plant, um, tea with the roots. And more often than not, we're able to have one cup of a pretty decent tasting tea, kind of tastes just like dirt. And um, that individual, whether it's amphetamines or opiates, uh, and especially if they're on opiate replacement therapies like methadone or, or suboxone, they are able to um, um, quit more often than not cold turkey. Um, that is withdrawal symptom free. Um, and, and when somebody is, is going through withdrawals, certainly the administration of this ameliorates all withdrawal symptoms, everything from itching skin to night terrors and GI upsets. Um, so this is, um, I, I just really wanted to be able to kind of gesture towards addictions. I think this is the primary or number one most important way or reason that plant medicines are going to be used uh, or clinic, clinical applications of it or most common uses is, is in addictions. If we can manage almost every other uh, chronic disease with nutrition uh, more effectively, like sometimes literally 100x, um, then where, where is medicine valuable? It's in addictions. Um, so I, I wanted to be able to share that with you guys. These roots, I could just smell this video. Uh, they're, they're really, really uh, noxious, perfumey smelling um, roots. Uh, but yeah, you imagine the ability to help somebody uh, come out of that situation, quitting cold turkey, um, withdrawal symptom free, making your own decision. My grandma just told us that this plant calms you down so you're able to make your own decision. And to me, that sounded like addictions. So I used it in that setting uh, with a couple of people who asked for it. and. It was successful. And now having used this behind, uh, behind the curtain at uh, dozens of um, treatment centers across Ontario, I can um, be very confident in saying that this medicine is um, probably the most important uh, um, addictions medicine that there is. It's called Nadoana or Wood Betany, Pediculus canadensis is the Latin name. So that's a... Um, well, I mean, that's not all I wanted to share today, <laughs> um, but um, that's at least a good start. You know, I just wanted to share with everybody the way that I was taught about medicine, where all of my knowledge comes from. That's very important. Um, and uh, my experience in community over the past decade um, uh, addressing and trying to break down barriers, understanding what medicines are, are actually doing. You know, the intention of that was to facilitate proper conversations between pharmacists and myself to determine contraindications, 
um, of which over the past decade, uh, thousands of plant chemistry uh, uh, analyzed. Um, I have no contraindication with any medicine to report. <laughs> um, they all work very well together uh, to share with us the idea of a great partnership between plant medicines and, and um, uh, pharmaceutical medicines, uh, to not see these as opposing uh, um, uh, uh, powers, but um, r rather a, a great partnership uh, to share with you guys the uh, um, relationship opportunity that we have with plants um, where we can help them, they can help us, and human health and environmental health can increase simultaneously. Like what happens if every human in North America is responsible for these relationships? Uh, you, you, you have an incre incredible uh, responsibility to diversify immediate territory. And when you have a diverse uh, uh, a responsibility to diversify territory around you and diversity increases with plants, uh, so will pollinators, so will small mammals, other insects, and, uh, and, and everybody above that. So it's really fun to think about the necessary consultation, basic human responsibility of plant people relationships, uh, doing everything we can to be able to explore how those relationships work. Um, and the amount of knowledge that's there that can help us live just a normal life to dispel the idea of plants as therapies and, and, and to start to consider plants as being just a normal part of human life, uh, basic responsibility like cooking and sewing and walking uh, and washing your hands. So it's just a normal thing. Uh, and, and so I, I hope, um, uh, you know, I, 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 in, in these formats, I like sharing, you know, for the most part, ideas and, and guides and, and gestures towards proper processes um, rather than all of the details. Um, for working out all of those details, how do I pick? What does this relationship look like? How do I, like all of the how-to stuff, I'm a hands-on kind of teacher. So this format doesn't really suit that so well, but I do my best on like everyone was saying in the chat earlier i have an old blog that needs a horrendous amount of updating uh our patreon has a fair bit um a lot coming to that patreon our youtube instagram and facebook i think i'm tr i'm trying to use this kind of a platform to do the best i can to encourage and foster those relationships uh, for the benefit of us, but also our environment that we live in. Uh, so I'm really thankful for the opportunity. I was really happy when Nicole reached out uh, um, to be able to spend some time with you guys. But I wonder um, if we're going to be able to tackle some, uh, some questions. Joe, there's a few questions in the Q&A section um, from Jen. What kind of barks can we bathe in and how much bark should we use? Yeah, yeah there's lots uh, to get into the details of that is beyond the scope of this Q&A, I think. Uh, I think there's a bark bath uh, episode on our Patreon, but um, there's lots of different barks to bathe in that all help in different ways. Um, generally, we're using uh, a birch um, and a willow. Um, so I like to use alder to represent the most powerful of the birch medicines and to use uh, trembling aspen, um, which I think is the most gentle of the willow species. Um, those being probably the most important for your skin. Uh, you have in there the ability to correct hormones. Uh, so with scarring, and then also uh, with um, uh, um, the um, I was trying to read the chat. I forgot what I was saying. Uh, oh yeah, so the the birches to deal with the deep rooted hormonal issues, and then the willows to kind of really help with the uh, with the surface tissue. I guess I could say that. Um, uh, so the combination of the two tends to be able to deal with almost anything. Um, yeah, it's a, 
I, I, I think I said it in the beginning, so you could probably go back and, and listen to the species that I list off. Um, but yeah, um, lots of different barks to bathe in. That's going to be different everywhere too. Uh, like mm -hmm. I shared another image of sweet fern. Uh, sweet fern is the first bath for babies. Um, so throughout Comptonia peregrina is the Latin name. Throughout that plant's range, almost all of the people that live near that plant have the understanding of this is the baby's first bath. Uh, so that's really fun, uh, a fun thing too. So learning how to bathe with different medicines is a really valuable skill. And like I said, it's going to be different everywhere. Um, so I would, uh, you know, explore the knowledge that is contained within communities near you. Sound like a commercial. Communities coming soon. <laughs> Next question is from Susan or Susanna, excuse me. Since a lot of plants are region specific, can you tell us if there is something doing this type, if there is someone doing this type of work in the Sonoran, uh, Chihuahuan, Ch I'm so sorry, I'm butchering this, and deserts and the Colorado Plateau? Oh, I think that's all Nicole. <laughs> Wasn't that what we were talking about last night? The homelands? Yeah. yeah um out there um i i mean i think connecting with uh clayton uh brass coupe who's also a host of this and he is um the one that uh inspired this whole webinar series he has a really great um indigenous design course where um people from from all over indigenous people from all over come but they're um, is a lot of people that come from the Southwest. So you're going to meet all those types of people there that are doing that food sovereignty and plant work with, um, with plants from the area to consume as food, but also to consume as medicines. Um, I found that um, the bulk of people that I learned my information from as an herbalist in that area um, th that I met through um, Indigenous food sovereignty work um, and just really ingraining myself in the you know, in the communities and in the work as an activist as well, um, and picking up those picking up those plants. Um, but yeah, I think I think Clayton's is is a great place to go um, for that Sweet. two week. That's on the the uh, traditional Native American Farmers Association website um, to sign up to go to go to that um, Indigenous Design course. Um, and uh, yeah, Marion just posted that tnafa.org. org. Wanted to also announce the winner of the gift, um, the free gift. Clayton has graciously um, wanted uh, to send out um, every time we have a webinar, um, a gift to someone. And we have Rachel Armstrong. Um, and I hope that you're still on here, but we we have her info, right, Marion? And it, and it's Clayton, um, it's Clayton Braskaby's birthday today too. So I'm thankful that he's on here with us and want to wish him a happy birthday. Um, and we have about four minutes left before we have to jump off. But I also um, wanted to say that we are um, hoping to have Joe on um, for a second round where he can get in more detail. This is kind of like that, that intro to a lot of... Um, Joe's um, thoughts and information and facts that he has on nutrition and plant medicines. And we'd like to bring him back again so he can go a little deeper and we can uh, get into some more of those questions. And I think that uh, it looks, yeah, people are excited about that. And um, I just wanted to leave the floor open for, um, for Clayton, if he wants to say any last words um, at, or um, I don't, I'm trying to get on there to see if Clayton's still up. Yeah, if Clayton wants to see a few last few words, um, and then we'll hear um, a little bit from Joe as we depart. And I want to say thanks to everyone. Uh, yes, good afternoon. I, I'm assuming people can hear me. Um, thank you for uh, Nicole for finding Joe. Um, it's it's uh, it's just amazing. Um, I'm I'm going to assume that um, Joe has been extremely busy with his work. Um, 
over the over the decades, as you mentioned, and I'm I'm going to assume that uh, this webinar is going to um, uh, inundate you with more questions and um, and um, more work that needs to be done. Um, I had a little problem logging in uh, before this uh, this series uh, started this afternoon, but. Um, I, I found my found my way, think thankfully. Um, and Nicole, thank you for reminding reminding me that it is my birthday. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's always great to be reminded you're getting older. <laughs> but um, it's um, I, I just want to thank um, everyone, Native American Food Sovereignty Alliance. You yourself, Nicole and Joe, for um, uh, for being a part of this event today. Um, we I I tried to get this thing up and running um, actually during the pandemic, as the pandemic started, and um, um, I think everybody sort of internalized themselves and was was concentrating on um, um, their family themselves. And um, and continue to to do that through um, uh, through this pandemic. It's still with us, but uh, we're we're getting back out. And um, um, I'm hoping that um, this series will be helpful, useful for everyone. Not just because of the pandemic, but um, you know we need to be in good health um, to fulfill our responsibilities to ourselves. Uh, our families and to the earth it's the earth itself so uh that's all i wanted to say but i really want to uh thank uh joe for um for the work that he does and continue continues to do that miigwech All right, Thank, thanks so much everyone and thanks joe um if you want to leave us with the what you feel like right now is the best way for people to um, watch more of your videos. Cause I know you don't really have any publications out. You have your bird publications out available on your market, on your website. And I posted that in the chat. Um, but I, I mean, I found that searching your Facebook on Creators Garden is a really great, great way to find out things like people were asking about bark baths and things and how much you use. You address a lot of that, of that on your Facebook. And if you search Creators Garden, comma, Tamarack, then you're going to find a lot of the things that you've commented on here. And I'm wondering what you feel like is, is a good way for other people to get information. Yeah, uh, so I... Um, I took like a year off basically of almost all social media stuff I was just burnt from the pandemic so I haven't posted anything in so long and uh, because every time I post something uh, then, uh, then a million people want me to perform that in their community and and so I, I get busy so I, did, I didn't want to be so busy so I didn't post anything for a year so you're going to check out all my socials you see I uploaded one video to YouTube in the last year I think uh, so I have been spending the past couple of days recording and getting back into the groove and I think uh, starting this summer and throughout our harvest this year I'm going to be uh, pretty active on there so that all of our socials on Facebook Instagram YouTube um, um, our Patreon uh, and maybe even our blog we're going to be um, pretty steady uploads and updates uh, on in-person events, on uh, virtual events like this one. Um, yeah, and I always like to tell everybody I don't even like plants. <laughs> I like birds. Just kidding, I really like plants now. I feel like that was kind of forced on me though. I've always liked birds, so we're creating lots of educational resources on birds and Nishnabe taxonomic procedures um which which is really fun as well but yeah all of the um uh all of our socials you know we we're, we'll we'll be uh we'll be pretty good this summer keeping everybody in the loop everything that we're up to all right thank you so much and thanks everyone for attending 
Um, we'll be doing this um, next month and we're gonna have Sewa, Yuli, um, and Yessi that are gonna be joining us and we're gonna be talking about um, birthing practices and traditional foods um, and how they work together as a traditional doula and uh, a birthing person. Um, and they'll be talking about their experiences together. And um, you can uh, check that out um, on NAFSA's website. Um, you can get on their mailing list. And I really wanna thank Marion Bitsui, who is behind the NAFSA logo there um, for all the technical work and all the background work that she's been doing to make this run really smoothly. And thank Clayton for, um, for instigating this and Joe for being an incredible speaker as always. Thank you, everyone.